Just turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, and this is our third and final uh, section of looking at this text. So, uh, gaining by abstaining. Listen, I want to start out by uh, just letting you know of a situation where this lady wanted to, she wanted to be part of this church. She gave her life to Jesus Christ, and uh, she really wanted to get involved in stuff that was going on. And so she went to one of the leaders of the church, and she said, how do I become a member of the church? And the guy says, well, just fill out this 15-page application. And, uh, you know, as soon as you get it done, you bring it back and, and uh, give it to me, and I'll take care of everything. And so she did that. So excited, you know. In one week, she had all the paperwork all done and gave it to him. And then he says, okay, now we got these three books we want you to read. So she read those books in one week because, you know, she just wants to serve God and she wants to be a member of that church. And so uh, then she brings the books back and said, I looked at all of them here. Look, take a look at my notes. And he says, well, now we have uh, 12 weeks of classes that you need to take and then you'll have a personal interview also. Okay, so by this time she goes home. The woman is brokenhearted. She just wants to draw close to God. She really wants the Lord, has a strong desire. She goes home and is sobbing her eyes out. God, I just wanted to be a member of the church. I just, I just want to be close to you. I just want to be part of what's going on over there. And the Lord Jesus spoke to her heart and he said, take comfort, my daughter. I've been trying for a long time myself to get in that church. <laughs> And so, yeah, okay, here's, the, there was a time when people respected Jesus Christ, and they had a great desire, and they wanted to be part of it, and today we're living in a postmodern era, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, so if you're unaware, you will be aware by the time we're finished today, where people are going, and how they look at truth, and how uh, they look at reality anymore is so different than what most of us remember and today we have people that really have no interest in being part of what God is really up to, as opposed to the, the lady in the story. So we're going to go ahead and read through our test. And if Robert, you could come on up here to the mic. Let's go ahead out of respect for the Lord, stand before his presence. And Robert, go ahead and just read our text. First Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Beloved. I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, uh, Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11 state that one day everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So if you're able to today, we're going to go to prayer. I ask that you would take a knee. If you're physically unable to, please just sit down. But like I said, every knee will bow. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be poured out and anoint this property, that you would speak to all of our hearts, that you would open up the eyes of our hearts, that we would receive this message today gladly, glean from it so that we can apply it to our lives and give it to others. And Father, as we honor those men here today on Father's Day, I ask that as fathers and heads of the household, that you, we, they would, we would all, me, myself, would share who you are with our sons and daughters, that we would be the leaders and fathers of our household and be good examples. But Father, your word says in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, that all who receive your son and all who believe in the name of Jesus to those would be called the children of God. So you, Father, are our true Father. You are our Abba. So we honor you today as the true Father. And I pray that each and every man and woman here are truly born again, that you are their Father. You are our Abba. And we give you that honor because you truly are our strength, 
our protection, and our guidance. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, while you're getting back in your seat, we'll go ahead and give a quick recap. If you've missed part one, part two, then uh, we'll go over part one, which we called the good. We went from the good, the bad, to the ugly. Today's the ugly, but it's not that bad. In the first Bible study, we talked about fighting the good fight. Well, and how do you even start doing that? Because uh, many times people are just kind of in the dark of how to do that which is good. And God led us into Genesis, and we saw there that in chapter 6, verse 8, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah had to be seeking the face of God. Jameson, Faust, and Brown commentators had noted that these terms like seek the face of God is like saying seeking the grace of God. And so we saw there that Noah was the only guy that really had a mind toward seeking the Lord. And so we were encouraged not to make peace treaties with sin. Never a good idea. Too many people just wave the white flag of surrender to temptation and give in. From there, we got into the second message was the bad. And we talked about the flesh and how it's always fabricating an attraction towards sin in our lives. It's always fabricating that which it will stimulate us towards sinning. And it's something that we live with. It's a force that's inside. It's not to do with your skin. It has everything to do with a force that's within where we feel this lure, this pull toward temptation. We noted the word abstain, that abstain means to hold oneself off, pull yourself back, hold yourself off from sin and sinful behavior and the temptations that come. We noted how God says, Come, let's reason together, you and I. Let's talk about this. Let's figure this thing out. And uh, if alcohol, if, I'm sorry, if alcohol is really something that's satisfied, then alcoholics would be the happiest people on earth. We noted that if heroin was something that brought satisfaction to people, then junkies would be the happiest, most fulfilled people on earth. If sex outside of marriage brought lasting happiness, well, then prostitutes would be the happiest people on earth. And then we noted and closed out with Samson. And I want you to think, I want you to try to go back in your memory. There were three things that we said about Samson. And if you remember, as he played with sin until he was lured into his demise, lost his sight, uh, he, was, he was pushing the wheel at the grinding stone, and then he finally lost his life. And we noted three things that sin will do to everybody, not just Samson. Do you remember what they were? Sin will blind, blind you. you. Thank you. Sin, sin will bind you. And grind you. Thank you very much. Can we do that all together? We don't want to lose this, because this is the consequence when you think, you know, a little bit of this, giving into this temptation will be fine. No, it won't. Sin will blind you. Okay, that was terrible. Let's start over. <laughs> Just calling it like it is. Sin will blind you. Sin will blind you. And then it'll grind you. And that's exactly what it does each and every time. And so today we unpack then the ugly. And starting out with the power of beautiful behavior in a world that has gone ugly. So if you follow along in your notes there, the power of a beautiful behavior in a world that has gone ugly. And probably not going to get too many arguments from people on that. I just want to start out by saying that our educational system goes far beyond the issues of political correctness, sexual orientation, gender equality, and social justice. Now, how, how does that happen? Large numbers of students currently today that are attending major universities from coast to coast in the United States of America are being indoctrinated. And it used to just be that evolution might have been, you know, the big deal as the school system will teach you about evolution as though it was fact. Remember when it was a theory? You remember that? When evolution was just the theory of evolution, now it's taught as though billions and billions of years are factual. Uh, when in fact they're not. Even the Bible shows us in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Job that the world was round. It is called the circle of the earth. 
So even before Christopher Columbus had left Spain and, uh, you know, figured, hey, why didn't he fall off the earth? Well, because it's not flat, it's round. And so large numbers of students are being indoctrinated in our major universities and small schools, even in high schools across our land. And one of the most uh, interesting uh, comments that have come my way is to see that there are many, not only students, but the adults who have paid the thousands of dollars to get them a higher education will come back and say, today, I am not really interested in Jesus Christ because he was white. Hello, have you ever seen people in the Middle East? Have, how many of you have met Rami Kamel? You know, there's a slight tan there. And then his hair looks a little different than that which is on the head of people from Jordan and as you travel east. But it's not exactly white people. And so factually speaking, people are embracing things that is their truth. It's their reality. Is it true? Not at all. Is it reality? Nope. But they're buying this. And what's stunning is that the parents will also buy into uh, these kind of philosophies. Let me tell you that the problem in the United States of America and around the world has nothing to do with color. You know what, you didn't, you didn't have anything to do with the city that you were born in, the parents that you had, the color that you would be. God loves souls and skin. He made souls and skin. They come in all kinds of shades. And our job is to love people. And that's the end of the whole story as far as being a Christian. I don't think there's any need to be talking about social justice in churches today to explain what the truth might have changed into. This is a spiritual issue, and here's the problem. Sin. It's it. It's just a three-letter word, the neglect of God, which leads to sin. Take a look at first, second, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, we want to look at verse 6 here. And as we do that, oh my, yeah. So, and you know what restrains him now. This is talking about the soon coming Antichrist that will actually have ruling power over the entire earth. There is something that is holding him back. The mystery of lawlessness is already going on, but it's not coming into fruition, not into its fullness uh, until something is missing. So watch this. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness, this is very important right here, is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then that lawless one will be revealed. So something has to be taken out. Something has to be taken away from the planet. And then this man that is referred to as the Antichrist will take his seat in full power in the world. And then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. Who restrains him? There is one restraining force. There are no humans that are a match for Lucifer. Do you understand that? There are no human beings that can stand up to Lucifer. He's a miracle-working demon. The Holy Spirit in the church has to be removed. It is the Holy Spirit that is the restraining force. I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is not going to work after the rapture of the church. I'm telling you that every person that is an authentic born-again Christian that has God, the Holy Spirit, living in them is going to be eliminated. They're going to be removed from earth. And you will be translated in a twinkling of an eye according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, to the presence of the Lord God Almighty, which leaves a seven-year period perfectly matching a Jewish wedding, which lasts seven days, only we will be to his, our groom, Jesus Christ, Father's house, which is what Middle Easterners do today. They build on to the Father's house. And Jesus is preparing a place for you right now. Isn't that good news? So we go on from there to realize that the mystery of lawlessness according to Jameson, Faust, and Brown, again, refers to something lying hidden, something undeveloped. Well, that's not so any longer. 
Lawlessness is increasing. Haven't you watched anything on television? Have you seen what has happened in Chicago in some of the bigger cities around the United States? And I talked to you before a few weeks ago, and we learned that it was actually Jesus Christ and, and discussion of Jesus and what he says in the Bible that started the Chicago riots. And we talked about that. And you can, read, you can look at the video yourself on YouTube, paint the wall black. And you'll see how Christ was actually the explosive beginning of it when somebody stood up and talked about biblical truth. Because there is no truth today. And that's what I want to begin talking about. The blindness of people on earth is not something that is budding, like it's just beginning to open. It is thriving. <clears throat> if you're to talk about something that you know is absolute truth, People will fight you tooth and nail to tell you that you're wrong and that's not their truth. That's why you hear people talking about the issue of two and two equaling five. You can't tell some students that two and two is four because it might hurt their feelings and then so to them the truth is two and two, two plus two now equals five. That's just an example. Blindness, as I noted, Samson becoming blind by his sin is thriving in this, what today is a postmodern era. And this is what I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about. If you want to understand what the postmodern era is that we're living in right now and why people think the way that they think, you have to go back to the pre-modern era. So there are some of you, a handful of you, that might remember some of these things. It's even before my time. But if you get into the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and you wanted to know what absolute morality was, you would look in a book called the Bible. You would take this, and people would buy that. They said, well, yeah, that's where you're going to find morality. That's where you're going to find the Ten Commandments. But then when we moved on from the 50s into the 60s and 70s, there were such great upheavals in culture in the United States and all around the world that abortion became legal. Jesus got kicked out of schools. The Ten Commandments began to disappear. Institutions began to lose credibility. Marriage as an institution became irrelevant. Well, we just, we'll have sex with whoever we want and we'll have free love and who needs that piece of paper anyway? Well, you know how important a piece of paper is once you buy a refrigerator that has a warranty, and if something goes wrong with the fridge before the warranty's up, that piece of paper becomes pretty important. <laughs> yeah, but people have their own truth and their own reality. And so when you look at the time period of the 60s and the 70s in our country, we drifted from a pre-modern, right, 40s, 50s. We left a pre-modern era. We moved into a modern era. This is modern. We do whatever we feel like. If it feels good, yeah, that's the mindset. And so where did that get us? It got us into a crazy society that we live worldwide today. That's where it got us. And so as sin began to run its, run its course, it brings us to a postmodern era, a postmodern society in which we live today. And so I could take somebody... I mean, I got tons of examples, but whatever. Let's say I go to a certain new age community north of Phoenix on Interstate 17 where it ends at Interstate 40 called Flagstaff. And I go there and I find somebody from the university at NAU and I take them outside and say, look, the sky is blue. I'm just using this as an example. I've never done it, but it's like somebody could look you square in the face and say, no, it's not. It's plaid. And then somebody over here could say, no, not really. It's a green sky with pink polka dots. And to them, they'll tell you that that's their reality and that's their truth. So don't be telling them that the sky is blue. And that's kind of where we're at right now. And that's why people neglect this Bible. That's why the Bible is so offensive. That's why Jesus is offensive. We were out there at the Hermel Plaza for this flea market that Black Canyon City is getting underway. And while we had a booth set up for grief sharing, Teen Challenge came alongside, and there's just a lot of Jesus talk when you get those two groups together. But every time a discussion uh, went into an area where the name Jesus was named, people walked away. 
He just walked away. I want to hear about it. And the tragedy is that every week you can go to the post office and look on the cork board and the bulletin board there and you can see that somebody died. And of course, you're going to say all the right things. You know, they're come to the celebration of life. People have no idea. There is a hell. Why would we want to hide that? There's a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's it. That's absolute truth. But that's not received in a postmodern era. I went to a Billy Graham crusade and I received Jesus in 1973, right in the midst of a change there, going into what's called that modern era. But there was still enough of the Jesus movement going on that I knew that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And I'm so glad I gave my life to him. That you, all of you in this room, and anybody watching on YouTube, you can have a life starting today that counts for eternity. Just don't get drawn into all the lies, like Samson did. And we covered that a couple weeks ago. But you can find all the messages on YouTube, at, uh, Calvary Corner BCC. Easy to follow. But I'm just saying, the world is full of ideas. The creation lasted billions and billions and billions of years. There's evidence with the explosion of Mount St. Helens when the volcano erupted, the deep canyons with seven rock layers were formed in two days. Two days, and there they were. And scientists will tell you, oh, that's the science. We're going with the science. It happened in two days. And what happened in the, uh, the modern era, the 60s and the 70s, that's where the mindset that became prevalent was we're going to follow science. And before any of that ever started, Christopher Columbus, before he ever went, God told us in the word of God in Job and Isaiah that the world was a circle. It was round. The Bible's 100% accurate scientifically, historically, geologically, geographically, and prophetically. Beat the prophetic part. It'll tell you 100% accuracy what's going to happen in the future. And what it tells us about the future is every one of you listening right now need Jesus Christ. You need to sell out to Jesus. He'll save you. He'll save anybody. But you need Jesus. And then you need to follow his instructions because that's the way to be blessed. You just don't want to say, well, everyone else is doing it. If it feels good, do it. Well, everyone else is. How many of you had a mom or a dad that said, hey, if your best friend's going to jump off the cliff, are you going to jump off too? Man, I don't know how many times I heard that. Okay, half of this church was blessed with that. So you just, you know, if, if Kenny jumps off the bridge into the river, are you going to jump too? You know, so, <laughs> take a look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, and we see here uh, the heart of this problem. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. This is life and death, folks. This is life and death. This is not go to church so you can be told this is your best life now. If this is your best life now, you're losing. Come on, look around. How can heaven not be better than this? In whose case, the God of this world, that will be Lucifer, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel, the light of the good news, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. When you want to know what God is like, all you have to do is look at Jesus Christ through the Gospels. Read the Gospels. Follow Jesus. Read all about him, and then you'll see that's what God the Father is. He's not some guy with a big, long, white beard and a great big hammer that's ready to smash down on you. God is love. He said, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Turn, turn, why will you perish? I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God takes no pleasure in people dying, even if they're wicked. He would all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. This is serious, very serious stuff. So what does God want you to know? Well, God wants you to know that matter, I'm sorry, manners matter. In light of especially 1 Peter 2, 12, our behavior impresses other people that are not believers in Jesus Christ. And that manner of living in which we exhibit 
can be the deciding factor for many people. But we have to decide too. We have to decide if we believe it, then are we going to live it? If you say that you're a Christian and you believe in Jesus Christ, that he's your Lord and your Savior, then somewhere along the line, you may not live a perfect life, but don't just use that as an excuse. At least find yourself on the increasing level, heading toward good behavior, heading toward godly behavior. Paul wrote many times, be an imitator of me. I'm an imitator of God. So God wants you to know. That's important. What does God want you to know? He wants you to know that your manner of living matters. A life lived well is the greatest reinforcement to the words you speak. If your life is not lived well in a godly fashion, why should any non-believer listen to you? You don't have any power between your, behind your words. There's nothing there to back up what you're saying. Ephesians 4.1, if you'd please... Uh, take a look here at Ephesians 4.1. Let's read this all together, okay? Nice and loud, all together. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. See, our, our behavior needs to match up. We have another one here, and if you could please put on Colossians 1.10. Here we go, all together. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Bearing fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what God wants to see hanging on your tree, the tree of your life. I think we had one more there too, didn't we? So we go ahead with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12. Ready? Help me out so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. That's what God wants. Three different letters, but all inspired by the Holy Spirit. So what does God want you to know? Live in a manner appropriate with being a Christian person. All right, we leave the power of a beautiful behavior in a world gone ugly and come to when talk is cheap, but a walk happens. If you turn in your Bibles with me to this one, and bring your Bibles to church gatherings. Jeremiah, we want to look at chapter 35, the book of Jeremiah. If you go to the middle of your Bible, close your Bible, open it in the middle, and turn right. And then you're going to find Jeremiah. We're going to be in chapter 35. I lightly noted this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but this guy gives just a wonderful example of somebody whose behavior was affected uh, by good counsel. And we're going to be talking about the sons of a guy named Jonadab. They're called Rechabites. And so, you know, for a lot of you, you might even say, what are we looking at the Rechabites for? Because the things of the Old Testament are given as examples for you and I to be instructed by. That's 1 Corinthians 10:11. And so, in chapter 35 of Jeremiah, in verse 2, the Bible says, as God is telling Jeremiah, go to the house of the Rechabites and speak to them and bring them into the house of the Lord, into the chambers and give them wine to drink. Now, God knew what was going to happen all along. But this is becoming an example now to the idolatrous people of Israel at the time. Watch how this pans out. Then I took Jehazi... Okay, if you can say that word, good for you. Azaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of another big long name, and his brothers. So they get all the sons together in the whole house of the Rechabites. He gets them all together. And then Jeremiah says, I brought them, in verse 4, into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igladaliah, the, the man of God, which was near the chamber of the officials, which was above the chamber of Maaseah, the son of Shalom, the doorkeeper. And then I set before the men of the house of the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups. And I said, drink wine. <laughs> and they, they said, we will not drink wine. For Jonadab, that's the name of their father. And that name means, it's kind of important, I'd put it in the margin. I did in my Bible. It means God is generous. So we will not drink wine. 
For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall not drink wine, you nor your sons, forever. So this was a lifelong, non-negotiable counsel. And you shall not build a house, and you shall not sow seed, and you shall not plant vineyards, own one, but in tents you shall dwell all your days, and you shall live many, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. You're only sojourning. You're not going to build a house. You're going to live in tents. Why? So that you may live many days in the land. What was about to happen to Israel? Nebuchadnezzar was coming with the Babylonian army, and he was going to take them captive to Babylon. But these guys were going to remain in that Bedouin state in the land of Israel. Don't build a house. Don't bother planting a vineyard. You're going to live in tents. And we have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, Rechab, our father, and all that he commanded us not to drink wine all the days uh, of our days that we, our wives and our sons or our daughters, nor to build houses for ourselves to dwell in. And we do not have a vineyard or field or seed. We only have, we have dwelt, we have only dwelt in tents and have obeyed and have done according to all Jonadab, our father, commanded us to do. They were simply obedient to what this man told them to do. He happened to be their father. Our father tells us how to live to be successful and blessed. If you want to go against that, you can, but it never ends up well. In verse 18 of the very same chapter, Jeremiah chapter 35, in verse 18, we see the culmination of this example for our instruction. Then Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab, your father, kept all his commands and done according to all that he commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me always. So God definitely is generous. You'll never be able to outgive God and just obey God in what he says, live the way he instructs you to live, and watch what God will do for you. I'm not telling you you're going to be rich, you're going to fly around in helicopters, or you're going to own jets. I'm just telling you that your life will be fulfilling, your life will mean something for eternity, you will live a blessed life, even starting now, by God. But you can't walk in your own reality and in your own truth and be blessed of God. He'll, God loves you, and if you claim to be a Christian, he'll be chasing you down to discipline you if you start thinking like that. And talk is cheap, but a walk happens. These guys, these what we call Rechabites, what the Bible called Rechabites, are being blessed of God. Just look at the middle of verse 18, where it says, because you have obeyed. What if you changed the words there and said, because you have obeyed the command of the Lord your God, your Father on Father's Day, kept all his commands and done according to all that he commanded you. Therefore, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not lack a man to stand before me always. What a blessing that God has given to him. Obey the commands of God and don't get sucked into the the ideas, the false ideas of what truth is and what reality is, as in the postmodern era, people are suggesting that everyone has their own truth and that they have their own reality and that it's valid, but it's not as far as God's concerned. As far as God's concerned, we're all sinners and we need Jesus Christ to be saved. And there is no other way. You'll never regret Gaining blessings of God by abstaining from worldliness. That refers to the title of these three messages. Gaining by abstaining. Where normally we think of getting more and having more, we actually gain more with Christ by abstaining from the things that are going to hurt you. The things that are going to hurt us. Question. And you know, you can answer this for yourself. Everyone. I have to answer it for me when I'm preparing these messages. And the Lord says to me, and the Lord is saying to you now, what are you looking at? What are you talking about? 
What are you entertaining yourself about? What are you laughing at? What are you looking at? What are you pertaining your attention to? What are you giving your attention to? And when you look at those things, if you see stuff that you know God is not into, get rid of it, amputate, cut that stuff out. The Rechabites show us what a real commitment looks like. They walked. They wouldn't drink that wine only because of what their father said. Now, lost people need to see our honorable behavior in a dishonorable world. They need to see something that looks honorable. And in the eyes of God, the only thing that's going to come off as honorable is people who are Christians, in fact, born again, walking with Jesus Christ. You know, if he's your best friend, not only your Savior and your Lord, then he's going to get on you. His traits, his character, that is all. The attributes of God are going to come upon me and you in this world, regardless of what people think, even if we're laughed at, even if we're rejected. God wants us all to feel his conviction about sin, not a composite of having one foot in the world and the other foot in church. And look, best way I can describe this. If you were to use colors, like colors of the rainbow, in order to depict a Christian and say, well, red would depict born-again Christians on the earth, okay? And blue would represent all the people that are lost and dead in their sins in this world. Would you look purple? Because when you put red and blue together, you get purple. Would you be purple or would you be red? Of course, God's design, because he loves you so much, is that you'd walk fully with him, like Caleb and Joshua, who followed God fully. And then they were the ones who went in the promised land. The other ten spies were cut out of the blessings of God. They didn't get there. They never went into it. Caleb was a man blessed of God. He was 85 years old on his birthday, and he says, I'm as strong and able to go out to war as I was when I turned 40. The guy was blessed. Because he followed God fully. Lost people need to see that honorable behavior. Because talk is cheap, only a walk really happens. Lost people know a fraud when they see one. They sure do. And they'll be the first to point it out. And I just want to warn you that the world is watching everything that we partake of. Today's average born-again Christian acts like they have a lack of for the passion of holiness. They have very little passion for holiness. And I'm talking not maybe here, but across the, the whole spectrum, across Christianity. And when you look at Christianity as a whole in the United States, what you're seeing is a lack of holiness. Holiness refers to other, something other than. You should look like something other than normal people. You should behave like something other than normal people. If Christ comes into our life, there's just a ton of things that we're not going to partake of anymore. And maybe they used to be part of our life. But to be moving away from those things, that's not who we are anymore. Let me give you an example. Years back, maybe a couple of decades ago, people used to have all these sayings. And uh, one of them was, and I hated this. I never understood it when I heard it. You've got to go back to the 70s to hear this one. Don't be so heavenly minded that you are. Oh, yeah, you've heard it too. Don't be so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. What does that mean, really? I mean, does that mean that you're supposed to be purple? <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? You, that you've got to be so worldly that nobody can tell that you're different, that you're just like everybody else. That you can run with that lost crowd and do what they're doing and get drunk, get high, fornicate left and right all over the place, and you're okay with that. Ooh, call time out. Emergency time out. And take a look at what you're doing and see if it lines up with Scripture. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I never understood it, and you know what? I don't want to. What are you doing? Are you lukewarm? You know, purple's the same thing as lukewarm. Here's another one. Don't look at me. You just look to Jesus. Well, see, the whole premise there is I'm a human being, so I'm going to fail. 
So don't look at me. Hey, 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 I screwed up. Yeah, I talk like this. I've talked like this my whole life. So, hey, you know, look at Jesus. No, 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 no. Paul said, be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. The world is watching. What do you mean, don't look at me, look at Jesus? Jesus, granted, he is the standard. But the world is watching. And God is not happy with people going to hell. If they hate him, he loves them. But if they don't come to him, they're lost, they're dead in their sins, and they're going to hell. And that's, that's the truth. And there's no postmodernism in what I'm telling you right now. It's just the absolute truth. And the world doesn't like it. Now, just to back up that statement, yes, Jesus is the standard, but the world is watching us. Take a look. And if you could run through these, Karen. Therefore, I exhort you, be imitators of me. There you go, 1 Corinthians 4.16. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern. It's a pattern. You have, you have, you have in us. Do what we're doing. Philippians 3.17. You also became imitators of us, of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia, for Thessalonians 1, 6 through 7. And then we have, and now we command you, this is a commandment, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. Let me cause pause right here. Ever since I've been a pastor, and that's for a few decades, let me tell you what, that's one verse that has never been applicable across the fruited plain as far as Christians are concerned. You tried church discipline on somebody and see what happens. Where's the law? But God wants us to be a good example. And in a postmodern society, you can hardly point out to somebody that they're doing something amiss, something that is sin. And so that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you receive from us, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 7. And we move on from there and we come to 2 Thessalonians 3, 9. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model. There's a model for you so that you would follow our example. God wants us to be models. And then we have 1 Timothy 4.12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech. So, you know, young people are not off the hook. Okay, this is regarding people who say, dare say, I am a Christian. And may you all have the strength to be bold and stand up, claim Jesus as he has claimed you. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech conduct Conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourselves. It's something we're to show yourself an example uh, to those who believe. And James 5.10, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And they did that in the face of persecution. So is that pretty much all of them? There you go. Was that enough to drive you crazy? I mean, the whole book. I mean, you I don't know how anybody, only somebody who has bought into the lies of a postmodern society can look you in the face after seeing all those verses and say, that's not my truth. <laughs> Fine. Talk that over with Jesus on the day of visitation. Because that's what's in verse 12. There's a day of visitation coming where everybody's going to give a speech explaining how they live this life on this earth. Most people, listen, we're getting toward the end here, and I want you to know that most people are never going to read a Bible. They're going to read you in your life. They're not going to read Bibles. They're going to look at you. They're going to look at your life. They're going to look at my life out there. I mean, this is where we really put our Christian suit on, and we come in these doors in this place. But out there is a different world. You enter the darkness when you go out these walls, and you become the light. That's what you walk out these doors, and like that sign says, when you walk out the doors, you're now entering the mission field. Go into all the world. 
Share the gospel. Jesus will be with you always. I know that you want to make your life count for something, that it would mean something for eternity. And a good way to do that is to just be a good example of what a Christian should be. Somebody who's been filled with the Holy Spirit and that your talk will match your walk. And finally, the issue is the outcome. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, the Bible says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds see you're sticking out. It's like you're red, they're blue. You don't want to be purple. They may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so what Peter is inferring is that by your example, people could come to Jesus Christ. That your walk will match your talk. And you'll have a behavior that backs up all the words that you say. And so, I think we have an overhead here. I looked up the word visitation just to get an accurate description and definition of this word, and it means to inspect. It refers to inspection uh, by implication that you were being interviewed by a superintendent and that the inspection was on regarding how you lived your life once you said you were a Christian person. And you know, people who are lost are not Christian people. Good people, being a good person doesn't make anybody a Christian person having faith in Jesus Christ, confessing him and welcoming him into their life. That makes you a Christian person. But each one of us are going to go through an inspection, not one unto salvation for us who are saved, but it's like as though Christ would show a video of your life. And the recesses of your heart, the depth of your heart would be revealed. It was between you and him. It's there. You can't hide from the video. You know, any jealousy, any bitterness, any unforgiveness, it's all in there. Well, what do you want that video for you to look like? I'll tell you what I want mine to look like. I was that, but now I'm not. That's the way I want to go out. I want to go out serving God full blast. You know, for lack of better terminology, I'm proud of this church. I'm proud of, proud of you that have contributed and what you've done in Choloteca. And there's a lot of you here that have no idea what it's like to go. You know, time has passed. The COVID happened, and we didn't go this year. But there's people here who can tell you by experience the love they have for those people, the number of salvations. You go down there, and you're going to lead a minimum of 30 people to Christ. And we don't just leave them there. We give them a pastor. And even after all this shutdown baloney, You stepped forward. You contributed. We want to put AC units on that church. Did you see that roof? There's no insulation. Chola Teca is the hottest place you can go to besides San Lorenzo in Honduras. It is humid. We're talking 95 degrees and 95 humidity. It's horrible, but it's tough. And so, you know, we're probably going to contribute to AC units on their farm. But the harvest is already obvious. It came from a tin roof. Why not give them a place to meet? They're in the biggest city we go to. So in that sense, I'm proud of the behavior of this church. For this Bible study, let's do an inspection on our life now before we stand for inspection with Jesus Christ. And I don't have time to go into all of that, but each one of you will give an account for how you lived your life once you were in the body. And those who lived with Selfish motives are going to have all their good works blown up by, as if by fire. There won't be anything left. Only those things which the Lord reckons to be like gold and silver and precious stones are going to be what's going to last. And those will go in a crown, and you can throw that crown before Jesus because we cast our crowns before him. Everyone's life is going to be evaluated as how you lived while in the body. Romans 14, 12 does tell us Let's go ahead and read it all together. Can we do that? Here we go. So then, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. We have one more. And we see here in 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, I'll go ahead and read. In all this, they were surprised. They are surprised that you do not run with them 
into the same excesses of dissipation. And they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's referring to this day of visitation. And the hope is that by your behavior, combined with your words, that people will come to Jesus Christ. And uh, the depths of our heart are going to be on display. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, the Bible says, Until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the, hidden, the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of people's or men's hearts. The deepest right recesses of our hearts are going to be on display. So just let's wrap this up. What, what should I now do with all this? You know, we saw what God wants us to know. Uh, we saw what God wants us to feel. You know, we don't want anybody going to hell. We, we want people going to heaven. We want people to have eternal life. Uh, we want to feel convicted enough to make sure that our talk matches our walk. And then we take a look at this. What do you want us to do about it, God? Well, here's what I prayed about and here's what I received. Memorize Matthew 5, 16 this week. Recite it to yourself in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. But recite Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. And speak it. Speak it throughout the day. Next Sunday morning, I would hope that we can gather together and recite it as a congregation. Because you know what my philosophy is on this? Just do that. And I believe that God will take care of the rest. I am not a cop to watch over your life, all right? I'm here to be actually a helper of your joy. And that's what I'm trying to do with this Bible study. To be a helper of your joy, to get life right. So let's read this one all together, okay? Can we do that? Let's do it. Everybody on YouTube, you follow. Here we go. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Let's do it one more time. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. See, it says in such a way in such a way that would match your walk, and might match your talk, and everything would come together with power to impress people that they too need Jesus Christ. And the last overhead I have is this over here. We got Michelangelo's statue of David. <clears throat> our choices due to our life determine what a sculpture's chisel does to a block of marble. The choices you and I make in our life are like a sculpture chiseling on a block of marble. And so when you look at this statue of David, now try to imagine that that was a block of marble. It was like stone. You got all that hair like that in there, you know, the eyes, and this, this guy did all the, I mean, the whole thing, just any detail your eye sees right there. That was all a block of stone. If you could put on the next one, and then we see here, there's just a different angle. And you know, just, you're kidding me. Just, you wouldn't want me to even try to do an ear. It wouldn't look like an ear, I'll guarantee you. And I think, did you have one more after that, or is this, is it? Okay, so there you go. I mean, the whole thing. So. How are you formed? By the choices you make. It's the choices I make for my life are going to determine uh, the quality that I turn out to be. And so I'm going with Jesus Christ, and I know you will too. And I trust that the Lord has spoken to you this morning. And uh, let's bow our hearts and our hands. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Thank you for showing us, Lord, that our choices will do to our life what a sculptor's chisel, Michelangelo, has done to a block of marble. And I pray, Lord, that the people will make good choices, that they'll be moved in their spirit to walk more closely and intently with you, that they'll be concerned about lost people, even if lost people say horrendous things about them. Strengthen the people of Calvary Black Canyon City so that 
be able to go full on, live full on lives for Jesus Christ. That you'll be so identifiable through their life. People will look and it's like seeing the qualities and the attributes of God as they live their life in submission to you. And turning away from the things of the past, looking forward to all that you have for them. And I just pray, Lord God, that our talk and our walk will absolutely match, that our behavior will matter to you, and that you'll be pleased, and that the day will come, it's going to come, that you could look at each one of us in this room and everybody listening out there, and hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen. The Bible is very distinct, and I pray, please don't try to get ready to walk out the door just yet, but just be patient enough and hear me out to say that a person is saved by grace through faith. Everyone has sinned. The wages of sin is death. Even one sin, according to James 2.10, will cause a person to suffer in hell forever. But being saved by grace through faith, not of works, that nobody can boast, Jesus Christ is reaching out right now. And if you need to receive, and you know, you know, God casts pride out of this room in the name of Jesus. All pride be gone. Just face yourself and don't be afraid to do that. You know. For as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believe in his name. And if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, God says you'll be saved. Check believe. Believe means to entrust your spiritual well-being to Jesus Christ. You're giving him everything. You're entrusting your spiritual well-being to him. He's in control now. I'm not the controller of my life. I'm giving it all over. He's got the wheel. I'm getting in the trunk. God doesn't need any backseat drivers. But seriously, if you'd like to pray and, and just make sure you give your life to Christ, why don't you tell him right now? While our heads are bowed and we're praying, why don't you just tell God right now is lo real love is passing by these aisles right now. Jesus is calling. So why, I'll just help you. Why don't you tell him, God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry. I believe in you. I want to make a confession. Right now, I am entrusting my spiritual well-being to you completely. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And don't ever leave me. And if you give me the power, I am ready to repent of sin and of fear. Make my life on earth Count for something that glorifies you. Thank you for saving my soul by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. You can all look up. You know, really and cast pride out of here. If you prayed like that today and you know it, it's very important that you acknowledge it. Uh, God wants you to start doing, this is the safest place on earth. If you prayed like that in, today and you're in the room right now, would you just lift up your hand long enough for me to see anybody pray like that? Okay. If you prayed and you watch this on YouTube there, there's a phone number and I'd like you to call that number. And uh, we want to talk with you and we want to pray with you.
Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Beautiful, beautiful, Jesus is beautiful, and Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. Carefully touching me, causing my eyes to see that Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. Beautiful, beautiful, Jesus is beautiful, and Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. Carefully touching me, causing my eyes to see that Jesus makes beautiful things of my life. And Jesus said to his apostles, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I said to you, I shall never again eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, take this, share it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread, let's go ahead and lift it up. And given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, Father, we see the holes in this bread, the baked, bruised images, the lines representing the stripes of the whip. And we are remembering this morning what you did to save our souls. Thank you for the gift of faith that we can believe in you. We're all yours, Jesus, and we want to honor you by partaking of this bread. In Jesus' name, let's partake of the bread together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's hold the cup up. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Thank you for the new covenant, O Lord our God, the king of this world. Thank you that you give us comforting verses to know that even though there are wicked people and governments all around the world, that the king is coming. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've told us that promotion does not come from the east or the west or the south, but it comes from you. And that your plan is being unfolded before our very eyes. The setup is all in order. And the king is coming. We're looking up, Lord, because our redemption is close. Thank you for tasting that which is so bitter in that crucifixion and all the rejection, all the pain, all the suffering taking the payment for all of our sins, paying the price to regain the world legally. Thank you. And thank you for saving our souls, giving us a future. Let's partake of the cup. Stand before the Lord. Can we do that? Well, I'm glad you're here today. I personally love church. <laughs> I just think it's the greatest thing going.
to be with like-minded people who love Jesus Christ. So, Father, I pray that you bless these people in ways that they can't even ask, but in such a way that it's identifiable. May your fingerprints be all over their life as you mold and shape them into the people that you intend them to be. May they put their faith in you, even when times are tough or things get thinned out, that they keep their focus on you and that you would meet their needs for them. And when their faith is tested, I pray they pass every test. Knowing that faith comes by hearing the word of God as much as possible, the faith becomes stronger when they have to use it. And so may their faith muscle be very strong. And I pray, Lord, your blessings upon their life. And I thank you for each person in this room and those who are listening uh, via the computer. Thank you so much. Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails. Heaven and earth will pass away. But Jesus never fails. The Lord bless you as you go his way this day.